51. We may make it all the way through verse 17. We will see. But we will attempt to read most of the 51st Psalm this morning. Psalm 51. We will start in verse 1. In my opinion, this would be on the short list of chapters in the Bible that you really need to read. This is a good one. I would say for Christians, we should read it, and we should read it often. Uh, If you've never read Psalm 51 or heard it, well, good news. We're going to talk about it today. But I would encourage you to spend some time this week on your own going through and, and reflecting on this passage. There is so much here to be said probably way more than we will get into today. But let's pray and we'll get started. Father God, we come to you and we thank you for your good words here. God, I pray that as we read these words that you would help us to to find you in them. Dear Lord, we all come into this room today with stuff going on in our life, things on our mind, good and bad. But dear Lord, I pray that if there are some in here that need to hear these words... And I would venture to say we all do, dear Lord, that we would hear them. That you'd meet us where we are, dear Lord, that we would leave here trusting you. Having put our faith in Jesus Christ, dear Lord. I pray that you would hide me behind the cross as I preach and teach. That you would keep me humble, dear Lord. That you'd take away any fear or nerves that I have. That I could accurately preach and teach your word in a way that brings the glory to you. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Often in these psalms, we see what is called a superscription. That is, a little writing before the psalm telling us something about the psalm. Now, sometimes those superscriptions don't really tell us a whole lot, but sometimes they tell us a lot. They tell us a whole story before we ever even get into the text. And Psalm 51 is a great psalm because we know the story. Or maybe you don't know the story, but we'll talk about it in a second. But... When we know the story, it makes it easier for us to relate to and understand what the words that David are saying, the meaning of them and the significance of them. And so thank the Lord we have that superscription telling us when this psalm was written. The superscription reads, For the choir director, a Davidic psalm, when Nathan the prophet came to him after he had gone to Bathsheba. Now, Perhaps you are familiar with the story of David, or perhaps you are not. I'll make a long story as short as I can. David was the second king of the nation of Israel. The first king was a guy by the name of Saul. And he was, I suppose we could say, a weak leader and disobedient to the Lord. And for that reason, the Lord took the kingship from Saul. And gave it to a man, a boy at the time, was was appointed to be the next king, although it would be some time before he would go into the office of king. But that next king to come after Saul was David. And David proved to be, for the most part, a pretty good king of the nation of Israel. He was a godly man, but he was not a perfect man. And even though David was a godly man, David sinned greatly against the Lord. And the story goes something like this. One day David saw as he was on the palace and looked out a woman bathing on the roof and naturally she caught his eye. Well, David did not do the right thing and turn away. Instead, he got Bathsheba to come and he slept with Bathsheba. And all would have been well except for the fact that soon it was going to be found out that she was pregnant. And what was he going to do? Bathsheba's husband was gone. That's why he wasn't in the picture. And he was gone and he was out fighting in David's army. And David says, now I have a big problem. I have slept with another man's wife. Soon I will be discovered. What will I do? Now instead of just confessing the whole thing and repenting and cutting his losses there, he decided, as oftentimes you and I do, to cover this up. I'll cover this up. That'll take care of everything. Here's what I'll do. 
I'll send for Bathsheba's husband and he'll come home from the war, naturally being a man away from his wife for a long time. He'll sleep with his wife and when she gives birth to a child, no one will know the difference and my tracks will be covered. Except Uriah was a, was a, was a man who appeared to have some integrity. And when he, when he came back in, he said, look, I can't go home to my wife while my friends and the other men are out there fighting, fighting the battle. And David said, well, that didn't work. So he came up with an alternate plan. He said, well, I'll, I'll get him drunk enough that eventually he'll go home and lay with his wife. But that plan failed too. And so eventually David came up with an even better plan. I'll send Uriah back to the fighting. And I'll send word that wherever he is in the fighting to that commander to take Uriah and to put Uriah in the fiercest part of the fighting. Put him on the front lines. Well, you know what happens there. The front lines are a very deadly place to be. If you're a soldier, you don't want to be on the front line because chances are you won't make it back from the front line. So it was with Uriah. He was placed on the front lines and he was killed. Well, now David's solution had come. Uriah is out of the picture, so there's no problem with David taking Bathsheba to be his wife. And all will be well. Who is going to know? But somebody knew, and that somebody was the Lord. Now, the Lord sent the prophet Nathan to David, and he told him this story about a man who only had this one little ewe lamb, and this other man who had everything. And the man who had everything came and took this one man's little lamb that he treasured and cherished. And David heard that story and he said, How dare somebody with everything take from someone who has nothing? And Nathan said to David, You are that man. And David knew what he had done. He recognized the weight of this sin. Not only had he slept with another man's wife, but David had murdered Uriah. Not by his own hands, but he was guilty of the murder of Uriah nonetheless. And David's heart was broken. He was broken because of his sin. He was broken because of the consequences of his sin that would soon befall him. And David utters these words in that moment. I don't know where anybody is today, but I know this. We have sin in our life. And some of our sin we may label as small, or perhaps some of our sin we would label as big. Well, sin is sin, regardless of how big or small we would label it. But here we see the beautiful words of David who had sinned greatly in his life. And perhaps you are sitting here today and you said, I have sinned greatly. What do I do? How do I seek the Lord? How do I pray? What do I do? Well, David shows us how to pray when we have sinned greatly. He says in verse 1, Be gracious to me, God, according to your faithful love, according to your abundant compassion. Blot out my rebellion. Wash away my guilt and cleanse me from my sin. Now, before we even get all the way through verse 1, we have a lot to consider there. Now, your translations may differ in the wording. Some may speak of mercy. Some may speak of grace. But here in, these first, in this first verse, we see some things that are very important. God is gracious. God is merciful. He said, look, be gracious to me according to your faithful love or to your steadfast love. Okay, God is gracious. God is merciful. God is steadfast. God is faithful. God is loving. According to your abundant compassion, God is compassionate. All of those things, David says, God, this is who you are. And we're not even through the first verse. We could split off each one of these and preach for weeks on each one of these individually. Maybe we will one day. But look at what we see of God. He is gracious. He is merciful. He is steadfast. He is faithful. He is loving. He is abundant in compassion. That is who God is. And we didn't even make it through verse 1. And we see who God is, but who are we? Well, David tells us that. 
at the end of verse 1 and verse 2. We are rebellious and guilty sinners. Now this sets the stage for what we need to acknowledge today in our life. God is good in every way, but we are sinners in need of God's grace. The first step that we must make when we seek the Lord and pray to the Lord for forgiveness of sin in our life is to acknowledge who God is and to acknowledge who we are. God, you are gracious, and I am a sinner. God, forgive me. God, blot out my rebellion. That's what David's prayer is, and perhaps that needs to be your prayer and my prayer today as well. Verse 3, For I am conscious of my rebellion, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you alone, I have sinned and done this evil in your sight. So you are right when you pass sentence. You are blameless when you judge. Indeed, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. What does David do? He says, I'm conscious of my rebellion. I acknowledge my sin. I am a sinner, God. And so it is for you and I. We are sinners too. The question today that we have to answer is, have you acknowledged that before Lord? the Lord? Have you acknowledged, I'm a sinner, God. I have sinned greatly against you. Maybe in the same way that David has. Maybe in a million other ways. But we are all sinners before the Lord. He says, against you alone I have sinned in your sight. Now, when we sin, it is a sin against God. Now, that's not to say that we don't do wrong from other people and that other people don't do wrong against us and that other people shouldn't forgive us and that we shouldn't forgive other people. But ultimately, every sin that we commit in our life is a sin against God. And David says, God, I have sinned against you. And he said, God, you are right. I am deserving of any punishment, any sentence you give me. God, you are right to pass judgment. You are a just God. God, I am a sinner. I am deserving of your punishment, but God, I ask for your grace. Now that takes boldness to come before the throne of God and acknowledge, God, you are gracious, I am a sinner, and I don't deserve it, but I come to you, God, not because I deserve it, but because you are gracious. Could I experience your grace today, Lord? That's what David is saying. He said, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me, or some of your translations say my mother conceived me in sin. It could be that in David's conception, there was some sin going on with his mother. It could be that David is simply saying, look, I'm a sinner from the time I come out of the womb. It's hard to know uh, in the original language there exactly what is meant. But it's clear to us in the past that David acknowledges his sin. Verse 6, Surely you desire integrity in the inner self, and you teach me wisdom deep within. Purify me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Well, certainly that is what God desires of us, is for us to be men and women of integrity, and David in this instance was not. And perhaps it is for you and I in our life today that there have been occasions that we should have been men and women of integrity, but instead we were men and women of sin in the same way that David was. We knew right from wrong. We knew what we should do and what we should not do. And we did what was sinful against God. And we think about it. God, I have sinned. I should have been a man or a woman of integrity. And God, I have done wrong. God, I am dirty. I am sinful. I am rebellious. So what is the cure for our sin and our rebellion and all the dirtiness of the sin that covers us? David says, purify me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Now, hyssop is a plant. We see hyssop mentioned sometime in Scripture. Uh, perhaps maybe one of the most prominent mentions of hyssop uh, is at the time of the Passover, when God is going to come through the land, and the firstborn in all of Egypt are going to be killed, except for those 
who cover the doorpost of their doors with the blood of the Lamb. That, that the side of the doors and above the doors are going to be covered with the blood. And God says, when I pass through, every door that is covered by the blood, I will pass by that house. And in that passage, they are to take hyssop, and they are to use that to paint the blood on the sides of the doorpost and above the door. And we see hyssop sometimes with purification, with sacrifice, once we get into the time of the law. And so when David uh, speaks of hyssop here, he's speaking symbolically. He's not, uh, I don't think, implying that somehow if he gets wiped down with hyssop, his sins are going to be made clean. It's symbolic language that God, I need to be washed as white as snow. My sin is dirty. I feel the grime. I feel the grunge of all the sin in my life. And we can relate to that. We feel that in our souls, right? When we are living in sin, we feel it in our soul. We feel dirty. We feel sinful. We feel rebellious. And that's not a good feeling to have. And so when David says these words, we can relate to those words regardless of what our sins are. We desire the same thing. To be men and women who experience the grace of God and to be cleansed by God. And it's only by God that we can be washed and be made whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed <laughs> rejoice. When we are in the midst of sin in our life, unrepentant sin, it has an effect on us. It has a great effect on us. David here uses the language, the bones you have crushed. He felt crushed to the very core. He felt crushed because of the sin that he had committed. And there's one thing that is true in our life. When we sin, there is no joy in that. There is no joy in our life when we sin, when we are living in sin, when we are unrepentant of our sin, there is no joy. Perhaps you say to yourself today, I don't have any joy in my life and I hadn't had any in a long time. Well, think for a second. Maybe the reason you don't have joy is because you have sin. Maybe you are aware of that sin. Maybe you came in here today and you weren't, but maybe in this moment the Holy Spirit is convicting you of some sin in your life that you know shouldn't be there and that has stolen the joy from your heart. The joy that God wants to give you, the joy that David once experienced in the Lord, he had lost. He didn't have that same joy because the sin had come into his life and stole that joy. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejo rejoice. Turn your face away from my sins and blot out my guilt. God, create a clean heart for me and renew a steadfast spirit within me. That is on the short list of one of my favorite verses in all of the Scripture. God, create a clean heart for me. I utter those words often because often my heart is pretty bad. Maybe yours is, maybe it is not, but oftentimes I find myself thinking of things and being tempted by things and sometimes giving in to things that I should not give in to and I look and I think, God, my heart is so bad. God, I love you. God, I desire you. God, I want to do good by you and even still sometimes I fail. And I look at my heart and I say, God, my heart needs to be changed it needs to be continually changed. It needs to be continually renewed. God, create a clean heart for me, David says. Why? Because his old heart was dirty because of sin. And renew a steadfast spirit within him. Perhaps what he's saying there, God, my, my spirit of old desire to do things that I wanted to do. But God, I want a new spirit, a steadfast spirit, one that doesn't cave in to sin, one that doesn't give in to sin, God, but one that seeks you. So give me a steadfast spirit to stand firm, that next time sin is before me, dear Lord, I do not fall, but I stand on you, God. Clean my heart, renew my spirit. Verse 11, do not banish me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. It's a scary thing to think that 
we will not be able to stand in the presence of God. It's a great thing when we come before the Lord, when we seek the Lord, when we live in obedience to the Lord, but if you have ever been in a time in your life where you have sinned and you do not feel the presence of God, that is the worst place you can be. It's not that God is not there, but we must repent. We must seek Him to find Him. And here David says, do not banish me from your presence. God, I don't want to be in my sin. I'm living in my sin. And God, it was so much better when I was living with you. So God, don't banish me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Now that's an interesting verse for us to consider, more time than we have to consider it today. Sometimes we see in the Old Testament the Spirit of God upon people. Now whether we see the use of the Spirit of God or Holy Spirit here, whether that's exactly the same as it is for you and I who have the Holy Spirit through putting our faith in Jesus Christ, I'm not sure if it's used in the same way as it was in the Old Testament as it is now. Perhaps uh, what David is saying here is not some form of loss of salvation that the Holy Spirit and dwelt in him in the same way that it does us. However, it's possible that that's what he meant. Uh, he could also mean just from a, a kingly way. Uh, and I say that because Saul, when he became king, the Spirit of God came upon him, but the Spirit of God also left him. And perhaps that's what David has in mind. Perhaps he is remembering Saul and Saul's very sin and that the Spirit of the Lord left Saul and David is saying, God, don't let your Spirit leave me. It came to me as the king. You gave me your Spirit and God, I have sinned greatly. So God, don't abandon me. God, don't leave me. God, I am acknowledging the sin that is in my life. And what does David say? God, if you'll forgive me, if you'll give me grace... He says, then I will teach the rebellious your ways and sinners will return to you. Well, that's what David's desire is, is to be restored so that God's grace can be given to others. I skipped a verse there, a very important verse. Verse 12, restore the joy of your salvation to me and give me a willing spirit. Now, I say that this passage is good for the Christian. It's certainly good for anybody. But it's good for the Christian maybe in a different way because David is a man of God. And what is he looking for here? He says, restore the joy of your salvation to me. That is, salvation is being saved, being saved from our sins, being in the presence of God. And joy accompanies that salvation. But when we sin, we lose that joy. And so he says, God, the joy that accompanies my salvation, restore that to me because my sin has stolen my joy. And his prayer is, God, restore my joy. Perhaps that needs to be the prayer of some in this room today. Perhaps your joy needs to be restored. And for what purpose? So many times, perhaps we say, oh God, forgive me of this and I'll never do it again and he forgives us of this, and we go and we do it again. But that doesn't appear to be the heart of David here. God, God, forgive me of this so that I can teach others your ways and other sinners will return to you. God, use my experience, my sin, as great as it was. God, show the graciousness and the greatness of your mercy and the greatness of your love by forgiving me, this great sinner, so that I can tell others so that they too can be forgiven of their sins. That sinners will hear of my story, God, and they will say, wow, there is hope for me. Maybe some of you come here today and you say, man, I'm hopeless. You are not hopeless. You may be living in sin. You may not have any joy. But I'll tell you today, you are not hopeless. There is joy in Jesus Christ. There is salvation in Jesus Christ. So don't leave here today thinking, man, I have sinned too greatly. Look, it's David. David was a man of God who should have stood for God. But instead, he gave in to his temptations to take a woman. He gave in to the temptation to murder another man to cover up his sin. And yet, God is gracious to David throughout the Scriptures. And so it is for us. God will be gracious to us if we come to him. Verse 14. Save me from the guilt of bloodshed, God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Lord, open my lips, 
and my mouth will declare your praise. Now that's the proper response. One, if we are sinners, we acknowledge that we are sinners. God, you are gracious. I am a sinner. In your grace will you forgive me and blot out my sins and wash me as white as snow. And God, when you do so, let me be found faithful to tell others about you. God, when you do so, let me open my lips and declare your praise. If God has touched your life and you've genuinely repented of your sin, that should result in praise. How can we do anything but praise the Lord when we realize the greatness of our sin and the fact that God in his mercy has forgiven our sins? David says, God, forgive me and I will praise you. And so it should be for us if we experience the forgiveness of God today that we shall be those who praise the Lord. You do not want sacrifice or I would give it. You are not pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit, God. You will not despise a broken and humble heart. These two verses are quite beautiful. There were certain sacrifices that were be, to be made to cover certain sins. But David recognized that really there was no sacrifice here that was sufficient to cover his sin. Nor is that really what God wanted. Now, we see God giving the command for sacrifices in the Old Testament. But what God really wanted in the Old Testament and on into the New Testament, what God really desires more than anything is for our heart to trust in Him. He wants our heart to be right. He does not want us just to go through the outward motions. Now, David could have went through the motions and he could have offered whatever sacrifices he thought he needed to offer, but he knew that no sacrifice that he could offer would be good enough. And he says, God, you don't want a sacrifice or I'd give it. If David could have sacrificed a million animals for the forgiveness of his sins that day, I suspect he would have done it. He probably could have got as many animals that he wanted, but he knew that that's not what God desired. He did not desire the outward. He desired a change inward. And so what is the change that God wants to see? What is pleasing to God? If none of our actions, none of our sacrifices, nothing we do is pleasing to God, what is? Well, what are some things that we may try to offer to God as atonement for our sin today? Well, we're probably not going out in the backyard and slaughtering a goat or a, or a bird or anything else, but, but perhaps there are other ways that we try to atone for our sin. Perhaps we say, well, I have really sinned bad this week, so I'll make sure I go to church every Sunday this month. And if I go for a month, that'll probably atone for the sin that I've committed. Maybe you say, boy, I've really sinned bad this week, so I'm going to put a little more money in the offering plate this week. Boy, I have really sinned bad this week, so I'm going to read a few more scriptures. I'm only going to listen to the Christian station on the radio this week. And somehow we can, we, can, we can appease God by saying, oh God, I did this really bad thing, but look at all these good things that I'm doing. Those things are not appealing to God. God doesn't care about our outward showing. He doesn't care about how good we pray or how often we come to church or how much money we put in. If we're doing it for ourselves in some way to atone for our sins by our own means, God doesn't care about that. And David acknowledges that. God, there's nothing I can give to you. God, there is nothing I can do for you. The only thing that God wants, as David says... The sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. God, you will not despise a broken and humble heart. Now, when we read these words of Psalm 51, I think it is safe to say that David had a broken spirit. He was crushed. He fully knew how great his sin was. But he also fully knew the grace of God. And even though Perhaps he felt undeserving of that grace. Where else could he turn? Where else could he go other than to humble himself before the Lord and say, God, here I am. There's nothing I can bring before you. So God, I just humble myself before you today and ask you to forgive me. And really, it's just that simple for you and I. You may have come into this room today a great sinner, in fact, we all are great sinners. And there is nothing we can do to earn God's love. There is nothing we can do to 
make God think that we are something special deserving of His grace. But God gives it nonetheless. And it's not because of anything we can do. You see, there was no sacrifice that could be offered to God, at least not in the Old Testament law that could atone for sins, but yet a sacrifice had to be given. Our sins had to be atoned for by some sacrifice, but a sacrifice that was far greater than the blood of goats and bulls and lambs and whatever else it would have been that they would have sacrificed. That greater sacrifice that God gave to us was through Jesus Christ who humbled himself on a cross so that we may be forgiven. It is through Jesus Christ that we can come boldly. Now, of course, by the time of David, Jesus hadn't come onto the scene yet, but when Jesus did come onto the scene, his blood would be able to cover the sins past and the sins future, and those include your sins and my sins. And so we come here today, and there is no sacrifice we can give to God We can only accept the sacrifice he has given to us in Jesus Christ. We need to come before Jesus Christ with broken hearts, humbled hearts, just as David acknowledges in this passage. There is forgiveness for your sin today. You may be living in a world full of chaos and a world full of sin, and you may think that God doesn't love you anymore, doesn't care about you, that you've sinned so greatly that he could never forgive you, but I want to tell you that's not true. Jesus died on the cross knowing full well all the sins that you would do. And he didn't die on the cross because, well, maybe this one will be too big, or maybe I can save a few people, but his sin or her sin will be too big. Nope, that's not the way it worked. Jesus died on a cross so that all sins can be forgiven. There's forgiveness in none other than the sacrifice in Jesus Christ. But to receive the atonement of Jesus Christ means that we repent. It means that we say, God, you are good and I am a sinner. It means that we say, God, I have sinned, but you forgive. What a phenomenal thing it is that God forgives sins. It's a crazy thing to even consider that God could do such a thing. And we know that because forgiving sins is hard. You let somebody do something wrong to you and you tell me how easy it is for you to forgive them. You say, oh, it wasn't too bad. Well, wait till somebody else comes and does something worse. Eventually, at some point, somebody is probably going to do something to you that's going to be so egregious that you are going to struggle with forgiving them. And yet, God looked at your sin and my sin, as egregious as it is, and he said, they are worth it. Jesus said, they are worth it. They are worth my beating. They are worth being mocked for. They are worth being nailed to a tree. Their sins are worth me going through this so that I can forgive them. I don't know how God does it. I don't know how Jesus did it, but I know he did it. I don't know how God loves me. Maybe you don't know how God loves you. Well, we don't have to know how. We just have to know he does. And we experience that love and that grace and that forgiveness when we repent of our sin as David did and put our faith in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you. We thank you for your good word. God, I pray that if there are some in this room today that are not yours, that are struggling with sin, and maybe they think, man, I have have done some bad stuff. Well, dear Lord, we see through the story of David today that you forgive men and women who do some bad stuff. God, that's not a license for us to keep doing bad stuff. We shouldn't keep sinning. But God, when we have sinned, there is grace. God, that's what makes grace grace. We don't deserve it. So God, I pray that if there are some that come into this room today that have come in here trying to earn your grace, that they would know that that's not possible, dear Lord. But God, if there are some that come in here today that aren't yours, living in sin, God, I pray that today their spirit is broken and they see that. God, I pray that today that as they acknowledge there's no joy in their life, that they know that it's because joy comes from you and you're not in their life. So God, I pray that if there is one in this room that has never placed their faith in Jesus Christ, that right now in this moment, that they would repent, dear Lord. 
Maybe they don't know the words to say, but God, we can simply say the words of David here. We can simply acknowledge your grace in Jesus Christ and ask you to forgive us. God, maybe there are some here today and they are yours. Maybe there are godly men and women who seek to serve you and do right, but maybe they have stumbled, dear Lord. Maybe they are experiencing that lack of joy in their life. Maybe their bones feel crushed today, dear Lord. God, I pray today that they'd come to you, that they can be restored. God, you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to save sinners, and that's what we are, dear Lord. But I pray that if there are any sinners in this room today that do not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that today they'd put their faith in Jesus. God, maybe some in this moment while I have prayed, they have prayed, God, while I was preaching, maybe in their heart, God, they acknowledged, they accepted Jesus Christ. I pray that if somebody made that decision to follow Jesus today, that as we sing, dear Lord, they'd come down, that they'd rejoice and praise you just as David did, knowing how good it will feel to get those sins forgiven, dear Lord. It is a great feeling to know that we are sinners, but sinners who have been forgiven. So God, I pray that if there's one that decided to follow Jesus today, that they would make that known, that we can baptize them, dear Lord, just as your word has commanded. And God, I pray that if there are some that are yours today, that you just would restore their soul, that you'd help them to seek you and repent and to find grace just as David did. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.